Good evening, everybody. If we could take our places. I'd like to call tonight's uh, August 16th, 2018, meeting of the City of Santa Barbara Harbor Commissioners to, to order. Uh, Ms. Prasinski, would you call roll, please? Yes, Bill Spicer. Here. Jim Sloan. Here. Betsy Kramer. Here. Lang Sly. Here. John Stedman. Here. Shoham Yaniv. Here. Merritt McRae is absent tonight. Very good. Uh, Mr. Reedman, any changes to tonight's agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, we do have a change. We're going to change the order of things up a little bit. Um, uh, Mr. Cronman is going to do part of the Harbor Operations Report right now before all the public comment, and um, then we're going to have uh, employee recognition, and then we'll move on with the, the normal order of the agenda. That sounds great. So at this point, Mr. Cronman. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. So last September, in the middle of a very warm Labor Day weekend, only minutes after a, a microburst storm cell raked the waterfront with 80 knot winds and, uh, and pounding, blinding rain, uh, Harbor Patrol officers Car Carl Halimachek and Nathan Aldridge, who were on duty and on vessels in the harbor at the time, uh, responded in, uh, to rescue some 16 plus individuals who'd been thrown from SUPs, kayaks, overturned small sailboats, and what have you. And, um, and they were all uh, uh, brought aboard, Harbor Patrol boats taken to the launch ramp, met with par by paramedics, and all of them ended up safe and sound. Nobody was severely injured or worse. In recognition of their efforts, the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators, NASBLA, if you will, California region, has honored officers Halimachek and Aldridge with a prestigious uh, award uh, it, for their life-saving efforts during this microburst event. And tonight, uh, Chair Spicer will read a proclamation from, the Na from NASBLA recognizing their achievements. And just one note before I turn the mic over to Mr. Chair, um, and that is that uh, Officer Aldridge, before he knew that he was going to be honored with this award, had already made plans to take his family to Costa Rica. So. He's winging his way to Costa Rica, so Officer Halimachek will accept the uh, presentation on behalf of both officers. And with that, Mr. Chair, I turn the mic over to you. Wonderful. Excuse me. have the pleasure on behalf of the Harbor Commission and a grateful Harbor community to uh, read this. Uh, as Mr. Cromman said, the National, National Association of State Boating Law Administrators, the Boating Law Enforcement Officers of the Year, be it, let it be known that Carl Halimachuk and Nathan Aldridge are hereby awarded the California Boating Law Enforcement Officer of the Year Award in recognition of outstanding public service unmatched professionalism in marine, in marine law environment and personal commitment to ensure safe and enjoyable recreational boating. Please join me in uh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you on behalf of the grateful community. If you wanted to say anything. Okay, so uh, again, thank you, Commission, um, for, for having me here and uh, for recognizing, um, uh, recognizing me for this award uh, for, for Nathan Aldridge as well. Um, I just want to thank the whole department. Um, working with these guys, uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing. It's a great place to work. Um, the waterfront is a, is a phenomenal place. I've been here for, for six years now, and um, I I'm hope I'm here for, for another 20 more. Um, I do just want to recognize uh, Ryan Kelly, Officer Ryan Kelly. Uh, he was um, a big contributor to uh, the rescue efforts that day. He was on boat three with me. Um, so again, I um, just want to share this award with him. And then to Nathan, um, uh, Officer Aldridge, uh, this was his first year for him, and what a, what a first year. Um, phenomenal officer, and uh, I, I know we're going to have many uh, great years with him. Uh, I was actually today, um, before I came in here, I just, uh, I kind of reflected 
a little bit on that day and um, just kind of want to give you guys kind of an overview of how it started and kind of how it ended. Um, so again, it happened uh, on September 3rd, 2017, so roughly a year ago. And uh, I came on duty that morning at 4 a.m. And immediately when I came on duty, uh, I had a report of a stolen vehicle out in the main harbor lot. Uh, followed by that, uh, I was on a Marine patrol and made several Marine law enforcement contacts uh, with my partner, uh, who was Officer Kelly at the time. Uh, followed by that, we had a theft uh, in progress at the Yacht Club. Followed by that, we had a vessel tow. Um, after the vessel tow, we had to deal with several uh, intoxicated subjects uh, down the waterfront area. And then the big microburst. Um, and as, as Mick read and as, as you uh, stated as well, um, well, we kind of all know what happened there. It was uh, quite a wild event, to say the least. Uh, immediately following that, uh, as we were coming in, uh, we had, had uh, Mr. Crommon had mentioned, uh, you know, we had taken several um, people that we pulled from the water back to the launch ramp. Uh, on our way back out to look for, for additional people, uh, we ran across a, a female who um, ended up being a suicidal subject uh, in the main channel. Um, multiple officers responded to that. Uh, following that, we had obviously our damage reports, and then the day ended around 7 o'clock at night. So, um, point of the story here is that we get to do so many cool things in this job. Um, we do marine law enforcement, we do law enforcement on land, we do um, obviously rescue boat ops, we do marine fire. I think that was the only thing we didn't have that day, I'll be quite honest. Um, <laughs> You know, we are, a lot of us are all certified lifeguards, um, marine firefighting. We do a lot of cool stuff. Um, and not only myself, but the, the other 10 officers I work with, they're highly skilled. And I'll be quite honest with you, I was just in the right spot at the right time uh, that day of the microburst, because I know every single one of those officers could have done the same thing or better. So um, very diverse job, and I'll be honest with you, I absolutely love it. Um, it's super challenging, and the best thing is I don't get bored. So I love it. I really do. Um, and then just lastly, uh, I said uh, just my family. Um, I just I want to thank my wife who's here tonight, and then my two young kids. Um, yeah, they're uh, they're it's it's great having them. I, they they can listen to all my crazy stories I come home with, and uh, you know they're they definitely are a big support. And in this job. Um, as a lot of public safety officers know, you have to have a good support system at home, and I have that. So I want to thank you guys for that. And uh, I think that's all I have for you guys. So again, thank you. Mr. Chair, if you'll permit me just a couple of quick additional comments. Um, I think Mr. Halimachek, uh very eloquently described the nature of a day as a Harbor Patrol officer. And, and most respectfully, uh, anybody who is of the impression that a Harbor Patrol rides around in boats and gets suntans all day, I think he, he um, uh, did a terrific job of describing what that suntan day really looks like if you, if you take it down and break it down by pieces. Also, regarding Officer Aldridge, you know, um, it was his first, not only his first year, he had been there two weeks. So he'd been on the job for two weeks, and it speaks not only to his skills personally, but it also speaks to who we hire as Harbor Patrol officers. I'm gonna be um, uh, honest at the risk of being blunt. We seek to hire the best. We set the bar high, we, we hire for excellence, we expect excellence, and we get excellence. And so that's why I personally, and I think there are others at this table and others in the Harbor community would agree, this is the finest Harbor Patrol unit in the state. So thank you. Thank you, and it's, it's nice to be a part of a, um, such a great story. So again, eloquently said, and congratulations. Okay, back to the mundane, the, the agenda. <laughs> um, okay, we are at... Public comment, I don't see any. We'll move quickly through that. Um, approval of the minutes. Move. I have a motion. Is there a second? There's a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays or abstentions? Okay. 
we'll hold up just a sec here. Okay, we are at the department update. Mr. Reedman. Yes, Mr. Chair, commissioners, since we last met, the council authorized the general services manager, purchasing manager, to issue a purchase order in the amount of $53,000 to Metropolitan Transit District, MTD, for our cruise ship booster shuttle service for uh, fiscal year 2019. And these are the four or so additional of the little shuttles that we hire when the um, when the cruise ships come to town to make it easier for folks to get downtown and so forth. And that's paid for directly by the department. Um, council author also authorized me to execute a lease agreement with Channel Islands Marine and Wildlife Institute, SIMWI, at uh, their barge location on the rock groin there at 301 West Cabrillo Boulevard. If you could put an address on it, that's what it would be, I suppose. Um, tentative items for the September meeting. Uh, fuel dock lease agreement, we're very close. We've ironed out the insurance issues. We're down to one last little point that we need. So I, I'm pretty confident we, we'll be able to bring you that lease uh, next month. And kind of in, in tandem with that is the ice house uh, license agreement. The fuel dock also operates the ice, ho the ice house mm. because they're right there. And so they just run up and dispense the ice, charge the fishermen, and we don't have to have somebody sitting there all the time operating it. So that, that's all I have for the director's report this month. I'll be happy right. to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Reedman? Um, I just real quick, the, um, the booster, uh, these are additional boats to help with the tendering of um, passengers from the cruise ships and back? I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. Um, these are from MTD and they supply the little electric oh, okay. shuttles you see going uh, up and down State Street and along the waterfront. Got it. And so we, we get <clears throat> usually four and they run um, very popular with the passengers and they take them right downtown. Got it, got it, of course. Commissioner Kramer. Yeah, <clears throat> do you get an accounting, I mean not necessarily an accounting, but the numbers from the MTD as to the um, number of passengers? Uh, I live in the general area and I frequently see that uh, shuttle go by empty much of the time. Not obviously when the cruise ships are here, but uh, the rest of the time. And I was just wondering if there are a series of numbers given to you. Yes, um, Chair Spicer, Commissioner Kramer, we do get a monthly accounting from MTD of passengers per hour and a number of other pretty pretty extensive data. Okay. And you're right, it's, it's the ridership along the waterfront legs uh, that we, uh, the waterfront department pays for is very disappointing. And we've looked over the years at ways <clears throat> of dealing with that, um, lowering the number of runs that, that it does and so forth. Um, so we're still looking at alternatives to that. I mean, I was wondering if there's possibly any way of advertising it of some sort. If you lower the number of runs, and people will, will be expecting to get on at, at, at nine o'clock, say, and it, if it's not going to be there till nine thirty, that, that's a problem. Right. But I wonder if he put in notices. I don't know. I mean, I'd just be nice if it were used. With City College coming up, maybe some flyer or something could be put up at City College. Uh, you know, park in the parking lot and take the shuttle. Yes, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Kramer, um, we did look at that briefly with City College, having them um, park in the Garden Street lot mm. and use some other mode of transportation to get over to the campus, such as bicycle or even the shuttle. But uh, I think that was a one, a one uh, or two semester experiment that didn't quite pan out either. Well, now with bigger shuttles, maybe it. Uh Will it happen? I don't know. I just. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did you have a question? No. All right. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we'll move to item three business services report. Mr. Bossy. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I just wanted to give you a fiscal year 2018 year end uh, summary of our slip transfer fee, uh, slip permit transfer fee revenues. Um, this is a 
has been for the last number of years a very solid source of revenue for the department. And you'll see on the schedule up on the screen, uh, this is from July 1st, 2017, June 30th, 2018, so fiscal year 18. And what we've done here is broken the total amount of slip transfers, which is 77, um, down into where they fit in into our various categories. Um, most of these, as you can see, are from 35 feet and below. Our biggest one was an 80 footer, but pretty dense uh, at that lower, at those smaller uh, boats from 30, 35 feet on down. Um, and you know, usually what happens uh, when we do break these down is it, it's roughly 35 feet and below and then 40 feet and above. They generally are, are, are pretty much the same. This, this year was a little skewed towards the, the smaller boats. As far as slip transfer uh, activity over the years, this is a chart that goes back to 2008. And so you can see it's been, for the most part, steadily progressing uh, in 2015, fiscal year 2015. We had our uh, biggest year, and that was a little over $1.2 million in revenue, and there were 91 um, slips that were transferred. This year, again, there were 77. Um, last year, fiscal year 2017, there were 79, and the difference between the two dollar-wise was about uh, $7,000. So um, we have adjusted uh, our annual budget revenue projections for the slip transfer uh, fee revenue. Um, it used to, I mean, back in 12 and 13, it was around the 550, 600 mark, and over the years, we've gradually notched it up, and it's now, for ne this current fiscal year, fiscal year 19, um, we set that bar at $1 million. So we're hopeful that it continues, but as you can see in those earlier years, it can drop off precipitously and with no rhyme or reason. So we'll see how that goes. And just wanted to give you an update because um, that's usually something that people find pretty interesting, the activity down in the harbor. So that's my report. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Bossy? Yeah, just, uh, I do. Uh, just out of curiosity, how come there was such a big big decrease from uh, 2015 to 2016. Do you guys, do you know what happened there? What it's just, that? uh, that's, a, that's a fair question. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of, we don't really have a lot of control of how many slips are being, mm -hmm. are, are being sold, are, are being transferred on a yearly basis. So um, 2015 was an amazing year. Uh, 2016 was great too, and this year again, we, we stuck right within that, just over that $1 million mark, about $1.1 .1 million, just a little bit over. So it's kind of hard to predict, um, just as it was hard to predict uh, in the earlier years, in 2009, fiscal year 2009, it just dropped off. Sure. I mean, it was less than half. So it, it's really hard to predict this one, and we always get a little antsy when we do have to come up with a revenue projection from it because we know the history that it can drop off at any minute. So we, we approach it very cautiously and, and we're hoping to keep it at that $1 million. And if it needs to be adjusted, we can bring that back to you folks as well. Okay. Mr. Chair, if I could just add a couple asterisks to what Brian said, which was absolutely asked, uh, uh, accurate. Uh, 2009, I think we all remember 2009, people weren't too eager to spend money on sure. boats. Right. This is right after the, the recession. And also it's important to keep in mind that uh, uh, it's for several years now, all, all the boats, all boats greater than 30 feet in length have been seeing a $25 a year uh, per foot, uh, $25 per foot increase. per year increase in the slip permit transfer fees. And that's also reflected in these increased sure. revenues, if that makes sense. Certainly. Commissioner Sloan did, uh, okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you, Brian. Uh, facilities management, Mr. Triberg. Good evening, Chair Spicer and commissioners. Uh, a key performance objective of the facilities division is the completion of 80% of minor capital improvement projects identified by staff at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, Capital improvement projects normally are defined as having a life expectancy of over five years and costing over $100,000. Those larger projects we bring to you typically in the fall every other year as part of a six-year capital improvement planning uh, project <coughs> plan. Uh, we have the minor, what we call the minor capital improvement projects are those that cost less than $100,000 and they're mostly done by staff. 
Uh, we have a few con done by contractors, but in general, uh, staff can complete these. This last fiscal year, 2018, we had 24 that we had identified. We completed 79, excuse me, we included 19 for a total of 79%. We didn't quite meet our performance objective of 80%. It tends to be a, a fairly high bar. It's, it's kind of tough to exceed that in any given year. Uh, we did quite a few projects, and I'm just going to talk briefly about each one of these just to give you an example of what our staff does and what we do with our contractors as well. The travel lift, beer is used, the travel lift pier is used by the Harbor Marine Works. It's uh, a fairly short pier. It's a wooden pier, which is somewhat unusual for a travel lift pier. If you can look at this picture to the right, there's a, the narrow leg is only about four feet wide. And to support a uh, travel lift that lifts very, very large vessels, relatively large vessels, it's kind of tough to keep up the structural integrity. The cross members we replaced this year with something new. We got uh, wood that was pre-coated for the polyurea product that's going to really help out. Normally with the tide going up and down, it's exposed. You get the wood rot and, and the treadle worms, and it, and it rots pretty quickly. We also added fiberglass jackets to the piles. I've, I've mentioned this to the commission in the past. This really increases the life expectancy. It's a lot uh, more efficient and keeps the facility in use as opposed to driving new piles. So this was a pretty significant project for staff to work on this year. Our largest project had to do with replacing the water line on Q, R, and S finger. Q, R, and S were built in 1998, and they're a completely different design than uh, Marina 1 A through P finger, which we just completed. It, what's odd about it is all the utilities are routed through the center of the dock, including water, electrical, and everything. Um, we've had problems with the water lines in the past. We already replaced the entire fire water line about eight years ago, and this year we replaced the domestic water line. The picture on the left is the before picture. It doesn't look a whole lot cleaner than the one on the right, but trust me, it is if you work on these things. Back in the corner right there, oops, let me go page up, is a valve that you're supposed to be able to reach in and turn off if there's a leak. <laughs> not only can you not reach in and turn it off, you can't replace it when the valve leaks like what happened last year. So the valve started leaking and there was no way to turn it off anywhere other than to turn off water to the entire marina. Fortunately, our staff had the, the foresight or the, or the um, the, the knowledge to go and, and butter it all up with some epoxy to stop the leak so we could put it back in service. The photograph on the right is what this junction box looks like now. We cut out everything. We replaced the PVC with HDPE, which is, the, which is what we use on all the docks now. Uh, it's much stronger. That's a valve right on the top. You can get to it. You can turn it. You can turn it off. Um, the yellow stub you see in that little corner there, that's the fire water line. We cut it all out and removed it to, to make more room for the domestic water line. Um, these are fairly significant for facility staff. It's really important for us and for Harbor Patrol officers when there's a leak to be able to go out, find a valve, turn it off, and to be able to repair it. This is the kind of leak that you could go, be out of service for weeks at a time. So that was, a, that was the biggest project. We replace dock boxes and power centers uh, kind of routinely and systematically throughout all the marinas. The one on the left is an older one. The one on the right obviously is a newer one. Part of the project is that we have power centers that go to each vessel. So there's, we make it so there's no longer power cords crossing docks. On the older docks, there's, we have that problem all along. So that's kind of an electrical upgrade that my staff can do and really is an improvement in all the marinas. Um, these are pile sleeves on 4B end tie. This is where we have some commercial leases for the uh, uh, Swift Water, the Swift Response oil spill response boats, the NOAA research vessel, and uh, uh, a, a um, dinner cruise ship. The only way to tie up to these things are to tie off to these pile sleeves. And believe it or not, as you can see in the middle, they tend to get saturated and sink over time. It's a pretty big deal to actually re make and replace these. My staff, they buy the sleeves, they add floats, and then we hired the local utility vessel, Danny C, and put those on. It's kind of a, it looks fairly simple, but it's fairly complicated, and it's essential to keep these boats secured in that mooring area. A couple other projects out on the wharf. We replaced all the picnic benches. I like to remind people we have a million pedestrians out there a year and 250,000 cars, and these picnic benches get a lot of use, and they get pretty beat up. This is all recycled plastic that looks a little bit like wood, so it kind of matches the aesthetic out there. That was something new that we did uh, at the request of one of the restaurant operators. And we rebuilt our uh, little visitor kiosk out there. The staff did all this. It looks a lot better. And it's, uh, you know, with all the visitors out there, we get to a lot of visitation. 
like I mentioned, we identified 24 and completed 19. Of those we didn't complete, we spend a tremendous amount of time and effort on those, such as redecking uh, docks in Marina 4. We didn't meet our objectives, so it's not one of those completed, but it still takes a lot of time and effort. We spend about $300,000 a year. It's about an average. It kind of fluctuates up and down depending on the number and type of projects. And the funding comes from our Harbor Preservation Fund, which is our capital fund, and also from our operating budget in both the harbor and the wharf. Um, and that's just a brief summary of what my staff got done this year and what uh, we got even more than we can get done already lined up for this particular fiscal year. So next summer we'll see what we get done and I'll report back out to you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you. Any questions? I, I have Commissioner Stedman. Yes. Uh, Carl, how, who came up with the 80% benchmark for performance? Chair Spicer, Commissioner Stedman. The city has performance objectives called the P3s that we adopt as part of our budget. And a, my predecessor actually came up with that. Um, I don't know why, but they did, and we've stuck with it. We tried to aim pretty high on the number of projects we identify, uh, just to, you know, to, to be as productive as we could be, but that's what it's been. We are usually between 75 and 85. We, we never get them all done. We hopefully never drop as low as 70%. It, 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 it's much more challenging than I kind of think it would be every, at the beginning of every fiscal year, but here 13 years later, we, we struggle to get 80% done. But so we do our best. Yeah, great performance. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I always love watching the travel hoist dro um, <laughs> pull stuff out and drop it in and thread the needle there. So thank you, Carl. Uh, Harbor operations, Mr. Cromman, the second part of your report. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, marking the harbor's, lar harbor's largest regatta of the year, 94 sailboats departed Santa Barbara on July 27th, kicking off the 46th annual King Harbor race, which, of course, is an 81-mile course journey, if you will, that uh, goes around the uh, east end of Anacapa, excuse me, the west end of Anacapa, and uh, down the coast and ends up uh, landing in um, uh, Redondo, at King Harbor in Redondo. Uh, this year, um, uh, since it's an off year for the Transpac race, for the, the biannual uh, Trans-Pacific Yacht Race, we had more boats than we would during a Transpac year, so we usually, we pulse like a sine wave. We'll have a lot of boats in a Transpac, a non-Transpac year, and then it drops during a Transpac year. And it was reflected this year. Uh, this year we, uh, had uh, uh, participation that exceeded uh, last year by 25 percent. There was a, uh, 88 of the boats, 88 of the 94 completed the race, um, and uh, this was compared to only 56 last year. And even though there was fairly, uh, there wasn't a real uh, racer's breeze, if you will, uh, blowing a prevailing west wind blowing uh, down the channel and, and offshore the islands. Uh, what I've learned, and, and I, Carl's the sailing expert on the management team, so I'm always on the uptake here, but what I've learned is this race had uh, its own share of excitement because the sailors ran into a spot of, of uh, dead water, if you will, or calm water south of Anacapa Island, and so what turned into you know, less than a you know, all-out steam to the finish line race turned into a tactical race, a search for win. So some boats split off and went inshore looking for breeze. Some boats split off, went offshore looking for breeze. And apparently it created a lot of excitement, a lot of, you know, tactical decision making and only added to the challenges in good time. The first boat arrived at King Harbor around 11 p.m. on race day. That's pretty quick, leaving here at noon and arriving in Redondo at 11 p.m. And the, and the final boat made it there just before noon on the following day. One can only imagine that they had a good leisurely time heading down the coast sailing to to Redondo. The, ov the overall winner was Medicine Man. Medicine Man's a 63-foot monohull. Apparently it really flies, especially for a monohull. Some years, the trimorans, if there's breeze, the trimorans have an advantage and they, they really scoot. But uh, this monohull is well known for its speed. It hails from Long Beach Harbor. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, give uh, credit where it's due to our local boats that uh, placed, and if you'll allow me, I'm going to put my head down, because if I tried to memorize this, I'd surely mess it up. So um, starting with uh, uh, Bernard Giraud on the, on the rock and roll, he came in fourth overall and second in the ultralight displacement boat D-class. Laura Schlesinger on the Warrior, fifth overall and the third in the ULDB B-class. 
Kenny Keating and John Vincent on the Argo 3 came in third on the ULDB D class, and Stephen Lemon on the, EO, on the EOS 2nd uh, Performance Handicap Racing Fleet B class came in second. Excuse me, that's not the name of the boat. He came in second. And uh, Vance Newell on the Epic came in third on the uh, Performance Handicap Racing Fleet D class. And finally, Rick Yabsley on the Captain Sluggo came in second on the Ultralight Displacement Boat F class. So obviously the department uh, reaches out and congratulations to all the participants of this year's race and looks forward to serving as the host harbor again next year. And with that, since we've already done the other part of my report, I would conclude and be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Cromman? Commissioner Stedman. Uh, Manager Treber, <laughs> you, you don't participate in this race? Uh, Chair Spicer, Commissioner Stedman, I've done it probably 15 or 20 times. Oh. I just didn't go this year. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I would expect to see your, your name on here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun, especially when the wind's up. Right. Great. Thank you, Mick. Appreciate it. We'll now move to uh, item six and new business. Um, Ms. Brzezinski, will you fill us in, please? Yes, item six, proposed lease agreement with Santa Barbara Shellfish Company. Uh, recommendation that Harbor Commission review and recommend City Council approval of a 10-year lease with two five-year options with Santa Barbara Shellfish Company, a California corporation, for the 1,160-square-foot restaurant located at 230 Stearns Wharf at an average base rent of $22,339.25 per month subject to an annual cost of living adjustment. Okay, Mr. Bossy. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, this is a proposed lease, again, with the Santa Barbara Shellfish uh, Incorporated and Santa Barbara, Sh sorry, company, Santa Barbara Shellfish Company has leased space on the Seaward Finger of Stearns Wharf since 1981. And as Jeanette alluded to, they have uh, take care of 1,160 square feet and they have 26 interior, they can go up to 26 interior seats. And keep that number in mind uh, for later on. There won't be a quiz, but I just wanna come back to that. Um, their lease terms uh, is a 10 year initial term with two five year options to extend. You just heard about the, the base rent. Their percentage rent is similar to our other restaurants in that it's a base rent or 10% of the tenant's gross receipts up to and including $1.25 million. And when they get above that, it goes to 11.4%. They're subject to a cost of living increase based on the consumer price index. Uh, their utilities, they are separately metered, so they pay those directly to the utility companies. And we also require a guarantee of lease, which is consistent with all of our uh, corporate waterfront tenants. Now, I should say that uh, the shellfish is considered by the department to be a tenant in good standing. They're active in the Wharf Merchants Association and they're prompt with their rent payments and they have no lease compliance problems. They are, uh, truly we have developed a great relationship with these folks. They're great to work with. They are our third largest grossing tenant and keep in mind that there are 26 seats out there. Um, and since 2008, they have increased their sales revenue. I went back and looked by 90%. So they do a remarkable job and I highly recommend you head on out and try it out for yourselves. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I should also note that uh, Mr. Adam White is here in attendance. Okay. Hello? Hello? The owner, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Reedman. Mr. Chair, if I may just add on a little bit. Um, I started here in, uh, at the waterfront in, in 1997 and we were buried in getting permits for a new redesigned Santa Barbara Shellfish Company with these, I think it's 21 uh, indoor, not even seats, they're bar stools. Mm. Uh, went, going through the permit process, working through the whole coastal development pro permit process, and right as they got the plans approved, the place burned down, the, that whole section of the wharf, if you'll recall, in 1998. Um, so, took care of the demo anyway, and um, <laughs> we put the wharf back together and they had a brand new, got a brand new restaurant. They, you know, obviously paid, built the thing themselves. 
And uh, it's just been really fascinating to watch the growth of such a small um, business into such a major player in the in the restaurant business down at the waterfront. So especially with a very limited menu, um, when you consider that their their lease is very specific and they can only serve shellfish, which some people have allergies to or worse, um, it's just phenomenally successful. So I just, and again, Adam White is here. I had the pleasure of working with Tom for many years in the earlier years of Shellfish and now his son, um, Adam. So uh, appreciate your support on this lease. Certainly. Any, any questions for Mr. Bossy? Um, real quick, and, and I echo what Scott said. It's a, it's a, it's a great local story. It's a great uh, business story. Um, what's the outside seating? Because I noticed that appears to have expanded uh, Mr. Chair, there are a few booths located outside on the on the harbor side, but those are actually open and available to the public. So that was part of the, the oh. permitting process where you can go out, obviously, if you go to Shellfish, but if you're just walking by, you can sit there too. I think most people are um, folks who have gone to Shellfish. And then you also have um, the picnic tables out in front and that Carl mentioned in his report earlier. And uh, those are also public, and they're posted public as well, so you can go out there and eat too. And we're thankful that in working with uh, Shellfish that they actually are the ones who uh, take care of those uh, picnic tables and keep them clean and, and wash them off. So we're very thankful that they've helped us out and they participate in that, and they, they do a good job of it, especially for how much traffic goes on out there. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Commissioner uh, Sly. Two questions. <clears throat> is the the term and the two options consistent with what you're doing with other restaurant leases uh, about that same term? And secondly, um, it was in a holdover status for almost a year. I'm just curious about that. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Sly, to answer your first question, uh, 10 years with two five years is probably a little longer, maybe an extra five years than we do uh, with most people. Maybe it's it's either a, a five and year initial term with two fives or a 10 with a five. Uh, we felt comfortable with um, what Shellfish is doing out there uh, and with their the amount of effort they put into um, the restaurant that, that we were comfortable uh, with that particular length of time uh, for a term. And then your second question was holdover status uh, for nearly a year. Um, they're busy people, uh, we're busy people and just, it, we've been in the process the whole time. Um, Adam and his family own a number of restaurants, very successful restaurants. So, um, we chase each other down when we can and, and we find time to, to meet. Um, and we, we weren't worried about it. Um, they were, they continue to do a good job. Uh, there were no issues with the negotiation process. We weren't at odds at any one particular issue. Um, it was just a matter of us, uh, the timing of us all coming together. And then you had obviously the fires, the mudslides, that kind of threw things off for a couple of months there too. And they were busy trying to recover um, people coming out to the wharf and things like that. So that took up a, a good chunk of time too. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, I think we have a, uh, I'd like I'd, to hear a motion. I'd move to accept the so there's been a motion second. and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions or nays? Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you. Please come up. Do I push a button here? or uh, I just wanted to um, thank the commission here for uh, being so... Uh, complimentary and um, so swift in their approval. Uh, we take the, the the responsibility of being out on the wharf very seriously. I grew up on that wharf, as, as Scott said. Uh, my dad started the place back in '80 or '81, sometime when I was just a you know little ankle ankle biter. But um, you know, uh, I wanted to also thank very sincerely the whole waterfront staff. Um, it's been a pleasure. It always has been a pleasure to work with all of them. You know, Mick, Carl, Brian. Uh, Scott, of course, and uh, also Pat Henry, who's not here, <clears throat> is a good one. Um, and uh, yeah, just we, can, we look forward to, to continuing to be a good Santa Barbara tradition and, uh, and doing the best we can. And thank you so much for your support. 
You're yeah. most welcome. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay, we are at number seven. Um, Jeanette, would you fill us in? Yes, item seven, underground fuel tank, fuel storage tank replacement work plan. Recommendation that Harbor Commission receive a staff report on the proposed plan to replace four underground fuel storage tanks located in Harbor Way. What? Who's the... Uh, Mr. Chair Spicer and okay. Commissioners, that's my report. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> diesel and gasoline are supplied to the Santa Barbara fuel, talk, fuel dock by underground storage tanks located in Harbor Way. Recent revisions to the Health and Safety Code require replacing the existing single wall tanks with double wall tanks. This is supposed to be done by 2025, and the oper operator, McCormick's Incorporated, is responsible for the replacement. McCormick's prepared a uh, construction work plan, this small book right here, in 2016 to come up with a, a conceptual plan to address the issue of replacing those tanks. This is mostly regulated by the County of Santa Barbara. The um, Santa Barbara County is certified by the California Environmental Protection Agency as the Certified Unified Program Agency, or COOPA, for the County of Santa Barbara. So as this, as this process advances, you'll hear more and more about uh, referring to Cupra and dealing with Cupra and um, consulting with them. To help orient viewers as to kind of what's going on here, <clears throat> the fuel dock is located at the end of the city pier. Here's the city pier. This is Brophy Brothers restaurant out here. The 117 building and the one, what we call the 125 building. Here are offices and then Harbor Way. So I'll talk a little bit about where the existing tanks are and what's proposed. Um, there are four existing single-walled uh, USTs, underground storage tanks, 12,000 gallons in each, and they were installed in 1983 to provide gasoline and diesel to the fuel dock. And uh, there is fuel piping in the alley between the 117 and the 125 building, which was replaced in 1995 with double-walled. Here's, here's one of the construction plans for that. Kind of gives you an idea of the orientation of the four tanks and where they're currently located. This work plan looked at several different alternatives. Uh, the operator, McCormick's, uh, really didn't want to re remove the existing tanks, so they looked seriously at abandoning the existing tanks in place and install new tanks somewhere else. That was denied by Coupa kind of right out the gate. They said you could never do that, and so uh, they looked at other options, such as installing above-ground tanks, which is really quite common, and you see that McCormick's main facility on, I believe it's Calle Cesar Chavez, their tanks are all above ground, but there's really just nowhere to put above ground tanks in the waterfront. So all are infeasible. So we got, went, got right back to uh, replacing the tanks in the existing location. They're proposing three double walled tanks, 12,000 gallons each. They feel that the, that capacity is enough to serve the boating public, still provide gas and diesel. And the fuel piping in the alley um, may, not need, may not require replacement. They've done some initial consultations with Coupa and if they can't, if they don't have to replace those, that would be a huge uh, win for all of us because this project's going to be quite disruptive. This is uh, an exhibit from the work plan to give you an idea of what's going to happen out here. Once again, here's this. This is the city pier, 125 building, 117 building. This is Harbor Way. This is the yacht club over here. This would be the work area. That entire area would be fenced off for probably three to four months, uh, excavate out and, and and take out the old tanks, put the new tanks in. There'd be dewatering, staging in here, and probably out in Harbor West as well. The entire area would be uh, closed off as necessary and when necessary. We've worked with them already in this concept plan to um, assure or ensure access out to Harbor Way, the travel up pier and the city pier, because we are a working harbor and we cannot shut down for three or four months. We've been in some preliminary discussions about doing all night work. Uh, and close the place off at night to the extent we can, let them go at it, and then during the day open it up for business as usual to the extent we can maintain business as usual out there. There are um, six primary things that need to be done or addressed in the work plan. The first one is site assessment, and that's really the most important thing. We have had contaminated soils out there from previous tanks. Uh, they have been remediated to the satisfaction of the county so far. But before they do anything, and as they develop the plans, they'll go out, they'll install wells, monitoring wells, 
check what the soil conditions like, uh, check the uh, groundwater recharge rates. All these tanks are, for all intents and purposes, underwater, below groundwater, so you got to pump that out and figure out what those rates are. Get back with Coupa and kind of review what the plan would be. Plans and permitting are the next step. That could take a while, as you can only imagine. And then the actual construction, uh, the main parts are really shoring and dewatering. You, you really have to shore this up. They're pretty steep banks. The, uh, they're right at the west end of the 125 building, so there's structural issues to deal with. Uh, removing the four existing 12,000 gallon tanks, managing all the soil as part of the excavation, where it's going to go, it's got to stay in the harbor somewhere, and then the installation of the new tanks. So this is a big deal. This would be by far the biggest and most disruptive project in the harbor since the tanks were put in in 1983. Uh, it, like I said, it's um, it's a work in progress. As Brian, as Scott mentioned, next month we hope to have the fuel dock lease back to you, and this is why we're describing this tonight. This is part of the lease and part of their longer-term plan is to go ahead and replace those tanks, and it shows a commitment by McCormick's to, to upgrade that facility. I estimate that planning, design, and permitting would take a couple years. There's really a lot to do to, to iron out all the bugs first. And construction would be about three to four months. It'd be very intense. We would probably do our best to make sure that they work as much as they can, be as efficient and productive as they can, because it will be so disruptive to the Harbor Commercial Area. And as I mentioned previously, uh, the Health and Safety Code requires this be completed by 2025. There's some nominal grant funds out there that I think McCormick's is looking into, but they're pretty nominal for a project like this. This is a many hundreds of thousands of dollars investment by McCormick's. Uh, regional cost estimate is about six to $800,000. So it's a, it's a pretty significant commitment by them, and we'll be working closely with them as they develop the plan. Obviously, we'll be coming back to you. Uh, I would expect in another year or so we'll know more, especially if they can get the monitoring wells in. We'll really have a, a good sense for what the scope of work is going to be and the scale of the work and, and uh, whether or not there's going to be any significant issues to resolve. This is a preliminary look at it. I know a little bit about it. Believe it or not, I've read that whole thing. I, I can't remember all of it, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about the project. And as I mentioned, we'll be back to you with, with details as they uh, become um, available. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, Perish the thought, but when you do the site assessment, if, if we were to find significant contamination, um, is there a plan B? I, I, I don't know how you could, I don't know what, what you would do in that instance, but has that been thought about? Chair Spicer, Commissioner Sly, it, it's been thought about. Keep in mind, this, this area has had contaminated soils that have been remediated already to the satisfaction of the, of the CUPA, which is, you know, also uh, kind of works under a state agency. Um, we'll have to deal with it, I would think. One remedy, of course, is to export off the contaminated soils and bring in good soil. Some of that's going to happen anyways. Um, Coupa really wants this to happen. Um, they do everything we can to make sure that if there are any contaminated soils or any contamination, it'll be re removed and remediated to the extent required by law and, and what's safe for the public. But that's one of the things we'll, we'll be reporting back to you and let you know just exactly what it's going to take. Okay. Commissioner Sloan. Um, aren't there monitor, monitors in the soil right now that will give us some mm -hmm. indication before we actually go in there and start digging? Chair Spicer, Commissioner Sloan, the, the monitoring stopped, I think, in 2014. I, it's in the report, uh, but they're, they're, they, they have to drill new wells because the existing wells were outside the footprint of where this is going to happen. So that's, that's the first process that they'll do. So they'll really kind of cover at the um, approval of Coupa exactly where these new wells will go in. And it'll give us a sense for just how much the soil has been cleaned up or if there's any issues whatsoever. Um, and are you looking at doing anything piggybacking on that for any of our improvements, like the sidewalk or anything? I can't think of anything else, but since it's going to be closed off, why not <laughs> do anything on your long list of things? Yeah, th that's a good point. Um, for the most part, we're going to, every square inch that isn't within the work zone, we're going to try and make available for public access. Yeah. We have looked at things like yourself and Commissioner Kramer and I've been working on related to sea level rise. Um, we spoke with the Coastal Commission about this and their understanding for harbor areas is they need to be raised up over time. And we talked a little bit about this and they kind of understand that the life expectancy of these tanks is probably shorter than the the time to really start responding to sea level rise. So they're kind of 
their preliminary read on this is you can go ahead and replace them in kind. Next round, we'll have to be thinking about raising things up and moving things around and importing fill. But yeah, I think we're, there's going to be so little space left over, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, it's, it's a, a thoroughfare that the public is aware of so we can bring traffic into the harbor. And how about the uh, fuel dock? Will it be shut down? Will fuel not be available in Santa Barbara during that Good time? Question. The goal would be to have fuel available through trucks. We've had the fuel, right. we've had it shut down before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Three to four months is a pretty long time, but McCormick's, they have um, trucks and they're capable right. of doing kind of an on-site fueling. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have just a real quick, in a perfect world, would, would the project start on January 2nd? and finish up as soon as you could? Chair Spicer, we'll, we'll look at the winter. Uh, that's, there's also problems with the winter as well. That area already floods in a high tide and a large swell. We've seen many times waves washing into it, which would be horrible for an excavation site. And a very rainy year would make it very, very difficult. The dewatering requirements would be pretty extreme. So we'll work with them and see what, what they're capable of dealing with, if they can deal with the, the pit filling up with water and dewatered adequately will certainly target the winter season. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Look forward to following up. <laughs> uh, okay, we go to item number eight. Jeanette, will you tell us about that? Yes, item eight, annual mooring report, recommendation that Harbor Commission receive a staff report on the status of the department's East Beach mooring program. Mr. Mr. Chair, yeah. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, um, the, our permitted mooring program was established in 2006. There were several uh, motivating factors to establish the permitted mooring area. We were trying to, A, provide visitor serving uses for people who didn't have slips in a very crowded harbor where demand exceeds supply. Uh, number two, we were trying to provide uh, mooring opportunities at an inexpensive cost for people who weren't able to get slips in Santa Barbara Harbor. And number three, we didn't want, we were trying to reduce the number of boats that ended up on East Beach in the wintertime. So in other words, our, our theory was that boats that were in the uh, winter anchorage would uh, end up getting mooring permits. So there were a lot of inputs into why we established the program. And it's been, wor it's been working since uh, 2006, as I mentioned. Uh, in deployment and inspection, these, these moorings are owned by individuals uh, who are part of the program, and the deployment and inspection costs are borne by them, and uh, they also pay for permit renewals of $250 apiece. So prior to January of 2015, the city had uh, issued permits via lottery, okay? So we had had, um, we figured, the, you've seen this before, right? We, we've, uh, you know, our lottery list for the slip waiting list is, is one example. And so we conducted lotteries, I think we did five of them uh, until we were over it, quite frankly, as was your commission. Why did it, were we over it? Why wasn't that a good way of issuing permits? And we did it once the number of permittees in the mooring area dropped below 30. Well, first, only a small minority of people who signed up for the mooring permits subsequently uh, were selected and ranked in these lotteries. Uh, excuse me, and were selected and ranked in these lotteries, ever followed through. And part of that reason was, I think, was sticker shock when they found out that to purchase a mooring from one of our uh, city-approved mooring contractors, um, the, they got cold feet. It cost about $5,000 to $7,000 to fully establish a brand new mooring. Not many folks have one in their backyard, their side yard, to take out and that meets our ground tackle specification, which are included as a attachment to your report. So that was one reason. A number, the second reason was that the amount of staff time involved in organizing the lottery, advertising it, soliciting participants and what have you, commission time, uh, time, community time really uh, uh, spoken broadly, was not worth the investment. And uh, three, um, in between the lotteries, people kept coming to the department saying, how do, I get a, how do I get a mooring permit? We're like, ah, you need to be in the lottery, but the lotteries aren't working. So your commission in 2015 um, decided we're going to go a different route. We're going to do a first come, first serve basis, right? And we thought this will be great. We'll have, you know, people lined up out the door and we'll have a waiting list and this, that, and the other. That hasn't proved to be the case. Uh, instead, what we've got is we've got 17 current permittees 
Those are in the uh, single bar hatched spaces. The double hatched spaces are areas that um, we have for one reason or another, mostly owing to uh, discovered or appearing seafloor uh, obstructions we have taken off, off the map. And when I say appearing, you know, we, every now and then we've had raging winter storms southeasters, and it, it's amazing the stuff that'll fly through the, the, uh, um, the seaway and, and land in oddball areas like some of you. And when I say fly, I mean it literally. An airplane wing wound up in one of these, uh, one of these mooring spots. So we've taken a, a few of them off the map. Uh, but the ones that are single hatch, those are the ones that are occupied. We have 17 now. It's down from 19 a couple, of, uh, a couple of years ago. And though we steadily field inquiries into, uh, you know, uh, um, getting a permit, uh, again, just like with the lotteries, people get sticker shock. I think usually that's, that's the, the reasons, and they don't follow through. The, another reason is they realize that they can't transfer these like you can transfer a slip, so their ownership of, unlike slips, which aren't owned, Right, their permits to occupy a parking space in the harbor. These actually are owned. These moorings are owned by the individuals who put them down. That's why there's a, a, a significant cost to them, but they can't transfer them. We didn't want to get into the business of transferring mooring permits. That would have been, we've learned that lesson, right? It was a slippery slope, so we didn't want to go there again. So, um, but we have 17 solid permittees. Some of, their, some of them have been there since the inception of the program in 2006. So it goes along at status quo. We've also used a provision in the mooring resolution, which is found in an attachment to your report, to issue a, at least one, and we're working on another one, a special use permit for a, a small boat out there that can have some urchin uh, uh, receivers attached to it so that uh, fishermen who uh, want to cure their catch plump it up for harvest, if you will. You know at Harbor Festival when you see those $15 sea urchins? Right. The, the, these are the folks that really take the what they call the princess or the prime sea urchins. And they it's like the bluefin tuna pens you see down on the Ensenada coast. Right. Mr. Sloan. Um, and the same thing out there. And so we're open to the notion of using having utilizing the language and the resolution, which allows for special use permits and working with individuals for that toward that kind of purpose. So with that being said, mostly boats might have some special use permits. We've got 17 folks out there. Now everybody's up to date on their inspections and uh, uh, payments. And so we're going to keep, I wouldn't say limping along, but we're going we're to keep the, uh, the, uh, the train moving down the track and keep our mooring pro program intact for now and uh, see how it goes over the next few years before we make any dramatic decisions about possibly shrinking the area that's occupied by moorings. That concludes my report. I'd be, oh, and one final thing, only two boats from the mooring area have grounded in the past two years, and both of them uh, were, uh, quite frankly, the uh, responsibility of the permittees. It had nothing to do with the mooring tackle. And if you notice, and I believe it's attachment two in the ground tackle specifications, um, attachment three, I apologize, attachment three, item 12, you'll see that we, pay, we, we uh, tell the per, uh, permittees in, quite emphatically that it's their responsibility to maintain that pendant that goes from the boat to the mooring. You're all, it's only as good as its weakest link. If it happens to be the bow of your boat, which uh, we typically, the contractors typically, re, the installers typically re, re, require a backing plate, not just tie it to a cleat or a, a bollard or something like that, so it yanks right off the boat. Um, the, both of those groundings were attributed to poor, uh, poor pendant attachments and poor uh, maintenance of those. So uh, you can see the ground tackle specifications are attached here. They're pretty rigorous. And the folks we have installing them, there are two companies in, in uh, the harbor that install those. They pay close attention to these, and they pay close attention to replacing parts that need replacement during their annual inspections. It's typically the dip section, what they call going from the anchor along the sand, you know, and it rubbing like sandpaper, and it rubs them raw, rubs the galvanizing off and what have you. That's the thing that it's the part that gets typically replaced every year. But with that, I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard enough about the moorings, and, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Crom. And any questions? Uh, Mick, I had one quick question. What's been our uh, high that we've had as far as uh, moors at this location? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I would have to research that and get okay. back to you, but I will. Okay. I know. I'm happy to do that. I'll okay. research and I'll email the commission. My guess is when we started, we, we may have been in the 30s. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. And, actually, and actually, what I'll do is I will look up um, a year-over-year -year comparison, and I will make a graph, and I'll send it to everybody. Thank you. And just for the record, I'm not, I'm not requesting this. I was just curious. So. <laughs> We're happy to do it. All right. Thank you. Um, oh, Commissioner Kramer. I have a question. Um, is, is there any inspection of the mooring of those boats that are not in the, in the permanent mooring, those that, they, that are there just for the summer or the spring or whatever? Madam Chair, <laughs> um, excuse me, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner Kramer, uh, no. Okay. Would be the answer to that. Um, they Thank come you. and they go, and uh, it sort of is what it is. It's, it's, it's advertised as a free anchorage. Well, some are there for quite a long time, and I just, I, I just wondered. Right. I'm, I'm familiar <laughs> with jurisdictions that have tried to implement 72-hour uh, maximum stays in the anchorage, like our main harbor parking lot, if you will, mm -hmm. for, for, uh, red, for red permits. But uh, chalking boats is pretty hard. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they tend to, they can move a little ways and, and you know, we'd be chasing our tail. But no, the, the short answer is no, there are no inspections. Other than we are vigilant about, you know, uh, uh, upsets and discharges and what have you about mm -hmm. looking for those. And, and, uh, and our officers patrol the area just about on a daily basis. So we do the very best we can. You know, I wasn't suggesting a <clears throat> that they be limited in, in, in time, mm -hmm. but with fall coming and possible storms and so forth. Uh, just wondering if there was any, any inspection. Sure. I think you all notify them and so forth. Thank you for, for that. Yeah. yeah, there is no a formal inspection process, <clears throat> process, but there is a formal notification mm -hmm. process. Well, informal, but formal to us. We make sure now that we have advanced weather forecasting uh, capabilities, not us, but National Weather Service, that at least 72 hours in advance of a big storm, we're notifying everybody, we're putting mm -hmm. notes on boats, we're knocking on the boats, we're you know, emailing, phoning, and what have you. And remarkably, over the last several years, most of those boats come in out, mm -hmm. of, uh, out of bad weather before it hits. We are a legislatively designated harbor of safe refuge, so uh -huh. we will take anybody any time to keep them out of harm's way. They have to, oh, they have to pay, you know, but we will find you know, uh, walkways, you know, ending, uh, whatever it takes to get them out of, in and out of a storm, because going out to get them in a storm mm. endangers not only them, but the officers going out to right. rescue them. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Croman. Uh, Mr. Reedman, any communications? Um, Chair Spicer, nothing from staff tonight, but I believe Commissioner Kramer had, had something she might want to add. Well, I thought add. Commissioner Sloan had something <laughs> you wanted to say. No. Well, I think we, can both, two of us can, say. we Please. can both take it here. Um, the, Commissioner Kramer and I <clears throat> are on the sea level rise subcommittee working group here in the city, looking at uh, um, um, a time frame of 2030, 2060, and 2100 with uh, projections of sea level rise and what we as a city might do uh, with regards to that. And we're not far enough into it to even understand all of the, the areas that we might even look at, but we have had two meetings. The first was an introductory meeting, um, and the second one was a presentation by the consultant that the city has hired in conjunction with the Coastal Commission. Um, to look at this, and so we're kind of just getting started, but I wanted to let everybody know that this process is on ongoing, and um, it's we're going to have several meetings a month to look into this, and so um, we're going to keep working on it and see uh, see where it goes. So, and we will obviously report back when there are some salient points to report back at. I'd just like to know that these are public meetings, and uh, they should be noticed, uh, whatever the notice requirements are. The next meeting will be August 28th. Um, it's going to be a slight problem as to where public could sit if the public comes in, but uh, they are public meetings. And we would certainly accommodate anybody that showed up. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you. They're I have fascinating, a... I should say. The, <laughs> the topics are fascinating. The details may not be, but... <laughs> no. Carl Triberg has been there, I should say. He's been there, both of them, the staff has, so... Okay, and I have one quick item as well. Um, I recently requested a uh, Harbor Patrol ride-along, and uh, um, 
went and uh, met with Mr. Croman and then Officer Kelly um, gave me a 45-minute tour. On, I'd, I'd done this before, but it had been a number of years. And unrelated to the awards earlier, I just wanted to uh, publicly thank Officer Kelly and the, and the Waterfront Department because it was fascinating. Uh, we had a spectacular time. He was very gracious at answering every minutia question I could come up with. And um, while we were out there, he followed, we had a a call had come in earlier and we followed up on it and it was a seal in distress and so we went out to the uh, the far buoy the red buoy just be out of the um, out the mouth of the harbor and we actually found the seal it was not in distress but we found the seal that had been called in and it was just um, um, you know, if you get the chance or you're interested uh, it was a terrific learning experience and I greatly appreciated it so thank you I guess with that, we can call for adjournment. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. <laughs>